So for a quick meditation, let's turn our attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18. That's a very familiar passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18, where Paul says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We all know Apostle Paul wrote this letter uh, during his uh, uh, third missionary journey. He planted this church during his second missionary journey. And from close family, as we, I'm going to go quick, so I'm not going to read all those verses from close family. He heard that there's a lot of problems that's happening in the church of Corinth, and uh, which made Paul wrote this, uh, write this letter in AD 56 at Ephesus. So when Paul writes this letter, the church of Corinth is going through severe problems. There's a lot of concerns. Even though they know the gospel, Paul found this church, Paul planted this church. They know the gospel, but there's a lot of problems that's going on. And we read from uh, chapter 2, the sexual immorality, there's idolatry. There's a lot of sinful habits that the Corinth church are carrying on, even though they know the gospel. And to that church, Paul is writing for the word of the cross or the message of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You'd see three uh, different things in this verse. You can classify this verse into three. The message of the cross to those who are perishing and to those who are being saved. So there's three, uh, two groups of people you see to those who are perishing and those who are being saved. And three main statements, the message of the cross, foolishness to those who are perishing, and the third, the power of God to those who are being saved. So what is this message of the cross? We know the cross was, mean, was a means of execution in the first century. In the ancient days, that's how they, they send people for execution. And in the Roman Empire, people had to carry their cross to death. If it was on top of a hill, they had to carry a, the cross from where they were to the hill and they would, get, they would get executed. And that's how Jesus got executed on the top of Golgotha, on the top of Calvary. So what made Jesus die? Or what was the cause of Jesus' death? We know Ephesians 2 says we were dead in our sins and transgressions. We were alienated from the presence of God. We were far away from God. We were distant from God. You see a lot of metaphors used by the apostles in the New Testament. We were dead in our sins. We could not save ourselves. Our strength could not save ourselves. Our merits could not save ourselves. Whatever, whatever you have to boast about could not save yourself. And that's why God the Father sent his only begotten son Jesus into this world to die for our salvation. And the message of cross states that God atoned for our sins. God sent his only son Jesus to reconcile us back to God when we could not reconcile back to God the Father by our strength or our merits. And that's the message of the cross which Paul is talking about. And in this context, if you look at it, verse 30, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1.30, Paul says the gospel, Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Four things he's mentioning about Jesus. Jesus became to us the wisdom of God, righteousness, holiness, and redemption. We could not become righteousness or we could not become righteous by our righteousness. We needed a righteousness from God. And that's what we see in Romans chapter 3, verses 31 to 30, oh, 21 to 26. The righteousness of God that was manifested through Jesus Christ. Apart from the law, the law and the prophets bear witness to it. But the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you get the righteousness of God. Or in theological terms we call the imputed righteousness from God is imputed to you just because you trust in the Lord. Just because you trust in God, you get the righteousness of God all. Or God sees you in Christ, or you are in Christ. You are united to Christ. You are baptized to Christ. There's a lot of metaphors that we see in New Testament just because you believe. But there's a responsibility on your part. You need to believe in the Lord. You need to trust in the Lord. 
You cannot take it for granted. But there is a price that Jesus paid for your trust. He became sin for us. When he knew no sin, he became sin for us so that those who believe in him will become the righteousness of God. And that is the message of the cross. You see love, you see sacrifice, you see justice, you see righteousness, you see the wrath of God being satisfied, you see justification, you see sanctification there, you see everything on the cross, all the eternal attributes of the Lord at the cross of Calvary. And it was not by our merits, but it was his mercy. It was his grace, his unchanging grace that he showed to each one of us. So that's the message of cross. And the second part, I want to talk about how is it foolishness to those who are perishing. You know, the Jews were ex expecting a political king, a political kingdom that a Messiah is going to establish a kingdom in Israel. But that's not what happened. Jesus didn't come to establish a political kingdom, but, God, but rather Jesus came to save the people, those who believe in him. Jesus came to save each and every one of us who were dead in our sins and transgressions. And that was his only agenda, to establish a spiritual kingdom in each one of us to those who believe in him. So why is it foolishness to those who are perishing? First, it fails to pass the logical minds of people. The cross of the Lord or the cross of Jesus Christ failed to pass the philosophical and logical minds. We know the city of Corinth, there's a lot of people who had knowledge. The knowledge was puffing up. And there's a lot of people who are skilled. So there's a lot of people who have wisdom. But the wisdom of the world could not save them. And that's what Paul is trying to mention in chapter 1. The wisdom of the Lord could save them, but the wisdom of the world could not save them. And that's why Jesus became the wisdom of God. Or Jesus became the wisdom from God. So it is foolishness to those who are perishing because it fails to pass the logical mindset of people. They don't see any beauty in the cross. They could not accept a person coming to lay down his life for their salvation. They could not comprehend that. And that's why it couldn't fail their logical mindset. Secondly, they didn't want to change from their sinful habits. The cross or the message of the cross was foolishness to those who are perishing because they did not want to change their sinful habits. And thirdly, the cross or the message of the cross was folly or foolishness to those who are perishing because they could not accepting a loving God sending his only begotten son to death. They could not comprehend that. They could not comprehend someone coming to die for them, for their sins, for their salvation. That was beneath their understanding. That was beyond their understanding. So three, men, three reasons I mentioned. How is it foolishness to those who are perishing? First, it failed to pass the logical and philosophical mindset of the people. Secondly, they wanted to continue in their sins. So message of cross, it's folly to them. And thirdly, they could not accept a loving God sending his only begotten son, Jesus, to die or to atone for their sins. 1 Corinthians 2.14 we read, natural man could not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them. So if you are thinking as a natural man, if you're thinking with the wisdom that the world gives you, you could not understand the things of the Spirit, right? You could not understand the things of the Spirit. You could not understand the things of God. But when you get regenerated by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit empowers you to understand the things of God. And what is your duty there? To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the responsibility given to each one of us. And here, if you look at the verse, 18th verse, it's a present continuous verse. When I looked at the Greek of that, it's still being saved. It's not saved. It's not will be saved. But it's saying being saved, which is the present continuous tense, which indicates the progressive sanctification that is happening in us. We are being saved. Yes, we were justified by faith in Christ alone. And now we are being saved by the Spirit every day. The Holy Spirit is empowering us and the Holy Spirit is doing inside us a work conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ every day for life, which we read in Romans chapter 8, verses 29, 28, 29. 
And the third part of this verse, how is it the power of God to those who are being saved? We mentioned, or I talked about the message of the cross. I talked about how is it foolishness to those who are perishing. And the third part, how is it the power of God to those who are being saved? Romans chapter 1 verse 16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and to the Greek for those who are believing. So the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Whenever we see the word power, we always equate it with the Holy Spirit and there's nothing wrong in it. But in this context, power of God means the dynam dynamite power or the Greek word dynamis. The dynamite power. No one could stop it. No one could stop the power of God. So when you believe in the Lord, the Holy Spirit regenerates your heart and by saving faith, you accept Christ as your personal Savior. And from that very point, the power of God is being manifested inside of you. Not because of your merit, but by His grace, by His mercy. The credit goes to grace. The credit goes to the Lord. The credit doesn't go to your belief, but rather the credit goes to grace and mercy that is being shown to you. Not because you paid a price, but because Jesus Christ paid a price at the cross of Calvary. Remember in the first chapter, uh, due to lack of time, I don't want to go and explain everything. But we see two wisdom. The wisdom from God and the wisdom from the world. Paul doesn't want to use clever words to convince them about the message of the cross. But rather Paul says, let the cross speak for itself. Let the cross of the Lord speak for itself. Because the cross of Calvary manifests the power of God for each and every one of you who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The cross sets aside and turns upside down the wisdom of the world. But rather the cross or the message of the cross brings down the wisdom from God to each and every one of us. Near us. Jesus is inside us now. Jesus is living inside of each and every one of us. The cross, the message of the cross. Without the message of the cross, without the cross, there's no reconciliation. There's no justification. There's no righteousness at all if you take out cross from Christianity. So today I want to talk, I want to, I want to ask you one question. Is cross the center of your life? Does the message of the cross transform your life? And is Jesus the Lord of your life? I've heard this story. Many of you might have heard this story. There was a church in England back in 20th century, the beginning of 20th century. There was this church in an English village. They had an inscription on the church, we preach Christ crucified. And there were some ivy plants that was, that was covering that inscription. In the beginning, you could see we preach Christ crucified. After years when the clergy's come, they see we preach Christ. The ivy plant has covered the crucified part. Yes, they preached Christ. They preached Christ as a good teacher. They preached Christ as a good example to follow, a good human being who was incarnated. But they forgot to preach the crucified Christ. Again, years went by. When the clergy's came, they see we preach. Ivy plants covered the Christ and the crucified. They say, they, the inscription reads, we preach. So it's a message to the church. Dear church, do we preach or do we preach Christ or do we preach Christ crucified as Paul says? If you take out cross from Christianity, the spirituality that we subscribe to is not the spirituality that Bible portrays. Or in other words, if you subscribe to a spirituality without the cross, that's not the Christianity that Bible portrays. So the message of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing and it is the power of God to those who are being saved. So what does that demand from you? What should be our response? I want to leave with that conclusion. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25 talks about our response to the message of the cross where Jesus says, deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. That is the radical response demanded from each and every disciple who believes Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Deny yourself. 
You might have to forgo your personal desires. You might have to forgo your personal dreams, your visions, whatever you have laid down for your personal life. Take up the cross, which means not just going through suffering, but to the point of death. Cross, cross shows death. Yes, suffering is there. Everything is there. Whatever you go through in this life is there. But when Jesus talks to his disciples, he says, deny yourself, take up your cross, which means you should be willing to die. And finally, he says, follow me. Follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the message of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God for each and every one of us who are being saved, who are being progressively sanctified by the Spirit, and our response should be to deny ourselves. Whatever that means, take up our cross and follow the footsteps of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God bless us with these words. Thank you.